ভয়েসটা নমস্কার নমস্কার ভাই নমস্কার বাণী হ্যাঁ সমস্ত নমস্কার বাণী নমস্কার গুড আফটারনুন एवरीवन সো টুডে ইউ আর গোইং টু হ্যাভ এ টক প্রসিদ দেবাসি মিশ্র ইউ নো দ্যাট ভবেশ স্যার ইজ দ্য প্রেসিডেন্ট অফ দ্য ওলিসা ইকোনমিক অ্যাসোসিয়েশন ইউ নো দ্যাট রাইট হ্যাঁ নমস্কার হ্যাঁ নমস্কার হ্যাঁ ওকে সো উই আর গোইং টু স্টার্ট গুড আফটারনুন एवरीवन Uh, you, you all know that on october 12 2020 আলফ্রেড নোবেল ওয়াজ আনাউন্সড অ্যান্ড টু ইকনমিস্ট নেমলি পল আর মিলগ্রম অ্যান্ড রবার্ট দি উইলসন রিসিভ দিস নোবেল প্রাইজ and uh, the, the contribution basically is uh, for the contract theory and uh, set the auction theory and uh, so for that actually we, are organi- we have organized this webinar and uh, we have with us uh, uh, Professor Devasis Mishra who is currently working in the economics and planning unit of Indian Statistical Institute uh, New Delhi and uh, so he will be delivering the lecture and uh, uh, the detailed introduction about the speaker will be given by uh, uh, mr sillu muduli uh, mr sillu muduli is uh, currently working in the reserve bank of india as the manager uh, in the department of economics and uh, policy research and sillu muduli is a student of uh, professor devasis mishra sillu muduli did his uh, uh, msc in economics at is delhi and after that he joined uh, the jagar institute of management bhubaneswar uh, phd and then in the midway he uh, has joined rbi uh, so he will be giving the detailed introduction of professor mishra now before we get into that uh, uh, i shall invite the president of orissa economics association uh, professor bhavesh sen uh, to give the introductory remark uh, and uh, to give the introduction of professor bhavesen professor bhavesen uh, served more than 35 years uh, uh, in the utkal university analytical and applied economics department and he taught econometrics to uh, me and uh, so many other people i think in the participant uh, list you will find probably many students of professor bhavesen so uh, he retired from utkal university in 2013 and uh, now he is also working as the adjunct professor in the jagar institute of management bhubaneswar so uh, with that uh, brief introduction of professor bhavesen now i invite uh, professor bhavesen to uh, uh, give the welcome remark uh, for this uh, webinar over to bhavesh sir yeah thank you narendra so, very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of uh, orissa economic association i welcome you Uh, to this we- webinar on contribution of Paul R. Milgram and Robert B. Wilson to auction theory. Um, I think both of them are from Stanford University and uh, uh, Professor Milgram had, uh, is an expert on game theory and auction theory and uh, Professor Wilson is his teacher, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think he's his teacher. And uh, so uh, we'll listen to the, uh, this very important uh, talk uh, after I just finish, uh, I just take a few minutes about the association I will be just talking about. Uh, the association is, uh, uh, is one of the oldest as- associations, as we all of us, as all of you know. and uh, we regularly uh, take uh, we regularly hold and organize academic discussions academic uh, like uh, seminars symposiums and uh, reports all these things are regular feature with our association every year we have an annual general body meeting the annual conference and every year also we publish one journal which is titled as Odisha Economic Journal and uh, this recently it has been enlisted in the uh, UGC CARE and 
we have also launched a new website uh, for uh, this Odisha Economic Journal where you can see all the past issues of Odisha Economic Journals uh, from its uh, date of inception. Uh, like uh, 1968, you will be able to get uh, the copies of this journal. And also we conduct uh, like uh, this uh, capacity building seminars and workshops for teachers and researchers of the state. And uh, we also take up these contemporary issues and we will make all academic discussions, make reports on those contemporary issues. And this year we prepared a report on COVID-19 and the economy of Odisha issues and challenges. And, uh, subse and uh, subsequently we also organized a, a, a webinar based on this report on June 18th. And after that, also we had another discussions by another discussion by Professor Prabhat Patnaik of Delhi University on a, on a strategic strategy for post-pandemic development. That was in July, and uh, and we are also in the process of bringing out a special issue of Orissa Economic Journal on COVID-19. And on 20th September, we organized. Uh, webinar on new economic policy and autonomy of universities. Uh, we invited speakers such as Professor Atul Sur of CSRD, JNU, uh, Dr. Bimala Ramchandran, ERU consultant, uh, Delhi, and uh, Professor Aditya Kumar Mahanti of Tripura University. And uh, on 10th of, on 17th October, we had another webinar on politics of natural resources privatization in Odisha, case of Chilika Lake, and the speaker was Dr. Matilde Aducci, Research Associate School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, and uh, discussants. Uh, Discussant was Dr. Virendra Kumar Nayak, a retired professor from Utkal University, and my good friend uh, Dr. Bani Kanta Mishra, who was also the former president of Odisha Economic Association, was the moderator, and we had a very nice discussion that day also. And uh, taking one step further, today we are going to have this uh, seminar or webinar on this contribution of uh, this Professor Milgram and Professor Wilson to option theory. And uh, Dr. Professor Devasis Mishra of ISI New Delhi will deliver the uh, talk. And uh, Mr. Sidhu Muduli, presently working in, as an economist in RBI, will be introducing our guest to you. And now it is over to Amarendra uh, to take it further. Amarendra, please take over. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for this little introduction about the association and introducing the topic. And again, and to inform uh, Professor Devasis Mishra that Orissa Economics Association has now about 700 life members, and that includes uh, the economists uh, and the students of economics from Odisha who are currently working in the state, as well as who are working outside the state. In fact, uh, there are also members uh, like uh, Professor Pasan Patnaik, uh, Professor Prabhat Patnaik, uh, William Naik, uh, Santos Panda, they have been, uh, the, uh, they were the past president of Odisha Economics Association. And they are also uh, in, in touch with us and they are also life members of the Odisha Economics Association. So we welcome uh, all the economists of Odisha who are working outside the state to join with the association so that uh, we can strengthen the association. Now with that uh, brief uh, note on the association, uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Silu Muduli currently who is uh, working as the manager uh, in the Department of Economics and Policy Research, uh, uh, Reserve Bank of India, Mumbai, uh, who is also a student of Professor Davasis Mishra. Uh, 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 in fact, I came to know uh, uh, Silu uh, uh, in Delhi, actually, when I was working in the Patan Finance Commission of India. And Silu and I were basically almost like neighbors. Silu was living in the hostel of ISA Delhi, and I was living in Patu Sarai. So we used to have very uh, good interaction, and uh, uh, I, I came to know actually uh, uh, the interest of Silu on mathematics and how 
he wants to develop a lot of uh, models on different aspects and that is also quite visible actually after that because he joined her PhD program in uh, the Javier Institute Management Bhubaneswar and after that he has joined RBA. Recently he has come up with a working paper uh, in, in Reserve Bank also. So with that brief introduction about Silu, now I invite uh, you to give the introduction of Professor Devasis Mishra. Uh, thank you, Abhinder sir. Uh, good afternoon everyone and wish you a happy Kumar Purnima. So today I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, my professor, uh, Dr. Devasis Mishra, who had a BTEC degree from IIT Khadakpur. Then he had a MS and PhD degree from University of Wisconsin, Madison. And now he is a professor at uh, Indian Statistical Institute, New Delhi. So the good thing about uh, uh, Devasis sir is that he is very good in teaching and his teaching is very simple, systematic, and that, that actually will be reflected also when he will present today. And the topic uh, that we're going to cover today is that on auction theory and you know auction theory is one of the i think one of the very uh, innovative as well as recent studies so uh, devasi sir is going to uh, teach about like the basics of auction theory and how it is important and how it is helpful and even not only in theory also in policy institutions like for example in our Reserve bank of india uh, sometimes uh, the liquidity conditions in the market, how banks and other participants in the open market operations are bidding, and from their bidding, from their bidding uh, strategies, it is also there are some lots of literature and studies recently. They derive the liquidity in the uh, market. So not only auction theory is based on information theory, but it also has a lot of applications. So I don't want to take much time. Now, another thing that I want to just to share with you all that, uh, so that Devasi sir had a very nice website. So in his website, he had a teaching notes. So his teaching notes are very simple. And I request all the participants, those who are teaching, those who are doing PhD or, uh, or mentoring the students, I request them, please kindly go to uh, the website and see what are the advanced topics and the simplicity of his teaching. And with proper citation, kindly have a look at it and introduce to your students. And uh, so that will help us in the development of economic science. So now I uh, request Devasi sir, please. So after a long time, I'm going to listen to your lecture. I am very thankful for this. So Devasi sir, please go ahead. OK, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, presentation. Uh, and you has already uh, you know, uh, hyped up the presentation so much, so I'm really scared what I will talk about. But I hope uh, it will be okay. Uh, so, uh, so today I'm, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences this year, and uh, the most, and, uh, and could you please again share it uh, because that is not visible. Okay. Okay. Sure. sure, sure. Let me reshare. Thank you. Actually, at any time there is some presentation uh, issue, you should tell me. Okay. Sure, sure. I'll be monitoring that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me start again. Um, is it visible now? Yes, it is coming. It is coming. Yes. Yeah. It, and, it and is it's moving, right? It's clear. Okay, so uh, I'll be talking about the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in, this year. And in particular, uh, as you all, all know that uh, the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences were given to Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson of uh, Stanford University for improvements to and innovations of new auction formats. Okay, and so so I should, uh, you know, the talk will be very, very simple and, uh, you know, kind of for the general audience. Uh, but the, uh, but the uh, thrust of the talk would be to introduce you to basics of auction theory and uh, in particular to give a hint of what the contributions of this year's winners are. And, and they, here, what I'm emphasizing is that this is not really the first prize in, on auctions. 
there had been prizes uh, nobel prizes given related to auctions so 1996 prize prize was uh, partially given for auction theory william wickrey is one of the pioneers of uh, uh, auctions a particular kind of auction that i will talk about and uh, 2007 prize was also partially given for some contributions to auction so it, it, you know technically this is going to be the third prize on auction so in a sense this gives you an idea of how important auctions have become in modern day of course we should not forget uh, all the prizes in game theory um, you know game theory is the foundation upon which auction theory stands and there have been many prizes on game theory uh, given so this is only a partial list there are some which i have omitted here but uh, uh, so overall it's a, uh, this prize is reinforcing the fact that game theory and auction theory is kind of very important to uh, for modern day economics you know so that's basically the the take away of this prize is so so coming back to auctions you know uh, one of the things that you would have noticed in the nobel prize announcements and subsequent interviews is that uh, they keep emphasizing that auctions are everywhere so it's very important to study them so initially i'm going to give you a flavor of some of the auctions that you may have seen and some of the auctions that you may not have seen okay so uh, uh, historically auctions go back to at least 500 bc uh, way uh, back Uh, to about 2500 years back and in babylonia and uh, they were used for some uh, you know morally repugnant transactions for instance uh, selling of brides in particular but uh, you know there have been other uses of auctions uh, uh, in day to day life now like uh, selling fish or flowers so these are like uh, daily auctions held in netherlands and japan and so on but what you must have heard surely is government auctions which are on spectrums and mines and so on you would have heard or maybe seen also auctions of private resources like houses advertisement slots broadcast rights and so on so in some sense auctions are everywhere and what you may or may not have heard about is google's auctions so uh, so this slide is uh, giving you a, you know a search result that i typed on google where i typed best running shoes for men and so initial you know frame of that result is a bunch of ads you know so so there are ad, so in fact it's written on top these are advertisements here and basically what google does is as soon as you start uh, you know searching for something like this it displays a bunch of ads not only that uh, these ads are instantaneously auctioned and these auctions are held in real time so essentially these are auctions held by a computer where buyers these advertising companies like amazon asics puma and so on they are also programmed sitting on google server so as soon as you type something these programs bid on slots and instantaneously google allocates these advertisement slots based on the auction that is held in real time and most of google's revenue come from these ad auctions in fact not only google now but microsoft and when yahoo was successful yahoo you know th these companies used to run ad auctions and most of their revenues used to come from that so this is one of the most uh, success stories of auction theory or game theory so to say uh, but more uh, you know uh, uh, you know going back in india i mean there are auction formats or auctions that are regularly held and that we may not have heard about and one of them what i find is fascinating is uh, these auctions of right to perform rituals in jain temples so these are called ghee bolis and uh, these uh, these auctions are held in jain temples uh, pretty regularly and the bids are pretty high you know so these are what are called charity auctions in in uh, literature so basically uh, you know you bid not only you appreciate the value 
of doing the ritual but also to get some prestige in the society and so on so there is a lot of literature in uh, religion and uh, religious uh, philosophy about these kind of auctions so here i'm putting the first page of such a paper uh, and there are you know uh, auctions which uh, happen in other kinds of settings so for instance uh, in 19th century india in particular in gujarat these guilds used to have auctions to raise taxes and i'll come back to these uh, auctions uh, in a minute because they kind of fit the models of milgram and wilson quite nicely so the idea here is that this guild has many shops in a let's imagine a shopping complex okay and but there is one day which is a holiday and basically uh, you know all the shops are supposed to be closed on that day but they want to keep one shop open in that shopping complex on that holiday and the reason is that there is demand and expected demand uh, you know then stop on holidays also so they, they want to keep one of the shops open and the way these guilds used to do it is hold an auction so you bid to keep your shop open okay so whoever bids the highest he keeps his shop open and that money is, goes back to the guild and and this guild would spend that uh, uh, money raised in the auction for all kinds of activities of the guild so this is uh, this is pretty uh, common and and it's still done in some parts of india in particular i have heard that in chennai these kind of things are pretty common still uh, and so uh, so these kind of things are you know uh, happen and uh, used to happen but what you see are more common auctions like ipl auctions so this is i'm uh, quoting another ipl auction where players are not auctioned but uh, you know the broadcasting rights and media rights are auctioned so these auctions are, are for very high amounts and usually media companies uh, bid for them and, and they get rights to broadcast and uh, advertise and so on so and of course uh, some auctions uh, which are done uh, which we also hear about so these are auctions of assets of defaulters i mean depending on the defaulter these auctions can also uh, you know uh, have very high bids and so on because valuable assets are sold so you might wonder like what's the big deal about auctions why why do we do auctions i mean in general if you go to a market what you see is posted prices right so there is a particular price of a particular item and basically uh, you know uh, you buy at that particular posted price right so that's usually the deal the posted price works very well if you have a good sense of what uh, the buyer's willingness to pay uh, for that or pro product is right in many cases so for instance the examples that i gave you the seller may not be very confident about what is the amount the buyer is willing to pay okay in those settings you know if you set as posted price it may be too high in which case nobody will be able to buy or it may be too low if it is too low then essentially you're leaving money on the table right because you could have increased the price and got more revenue from that so in a setting where the seller has uh, you know let's say does not have a good idea about willingness to pay of buyers figuring out appropriate posted price is very difficult and auctions are suitable in these kind of settings where they lead to a natural sense of price discovery okay so so that's why auctions are important in certain settings where the sellers uh, uh, does not have a good idea about the willingness to pay of buyers are so uh, so what i'm going to do now is basically give you a very very broad classification of auctions uh, in general auctions are classified as two types sealed bid and open cry so sealed bid as the name suggests essentially are auctions where i invite bids from all the buyers uh, and uh, i open those bids and based on the bids i allocate the object to someone and uh, charge him some price okay 
So these are simultaneous auctions where bids are submitted simultaneously in sealed envelopes. So imagine sealed envelopes. So that's why the term sealed bid. Open cry auctions are very different. So in uh, so in open cry auctions, uh, there is a price discovery mechanism in in the sense that you either start from a low price and bidders outbid each other till no bidder is left or exactly one bidder is left or you start from a high price and keep lowering the price so these are price discovery mechanisms open cry auctions and there are of course uh, many variations to rules and uh, also settings and so on inside each of these formats and so let me uh, describe two popular sealed bid auctions one is called what's called the first price auction so in first price auction the auctioneer which is usually the seller invites all the bids and uh, opens all of them and wh whichever bid is the highest that particular bidder gets the object and pays his bid so that's why it's called the first price auction in the second price auction the highest bidder wins just like in the first price auction but pays the second highest bid. So uh, it looks like an unusual auction, but I'll be, uh, hopefully I'll convince you that it's not so unusual after all in a couple of slides. So these are the two main uh, sealed bid auction formats. Uh, let me uh, talk about two uh, popular open cry for, uh, auction formats. And they are usually called the English auction or the Dutch auction, but it's more uh, convenient for you to remember them as ascending and descending price auctions. So an ascending price auction, uh, which is the English auction, is one. So the easiest way to imagine it is like there's a clock. So imagine a price clock, which starts at zero and continuously moves up. So it's a continuous clock and it is moving up. And uh, uh, bidders, you know, uh, they can drop out of the auction. So whenever, uh, you know, whenever they drop out, let's uh, have the rule that they cannot come back. So they see the price increasing in the auction. So at some point, you know, they think that the price is too high and, you know, there's no point staying in the auction. So they keep dropping out. And so the, uh, as soon as, all the bidders except one drop out of the auction so there is exactly one bidder remaining in the auction uh, then the auction clock stops so suddenly the auction clock will stop as soon as let's say there were four bidders three of them dropped so when the third bidder dropped the clock will stop and that's the price at which the only bidder who is remaining in the auction will win the object and pay that price okay, so that's the english auction Descending auction is, is kind of the dual of that or the counterpart of that in where the price is very high and lowered continuously. And because the price is very high uh, and assume that it's so high that nobody is interested in the object at such a high price. So it is lowered continuously. And the first instance somebody is interested in the uh, object at a price he presses a button and the price clock stops and whoever pressed the button first to stop the clock is the one who wins the object at that particular price okay so these are uh, i mean of course there are variants of this you may have seen or uh, read about but these are basically uh, the standard ways to describe these uh, four common auction formats so let me give an example to illustrate uh, uh, these auctions. So here on the left hand side, we have a descending price auction where the price started at 100 and it kept, kept on falling. The prices kept on falling. Then at price 70, bidder 2, let's call him bidder 2, he stops the clock. And basically once he stops the clock, uh, he wins the object at price 7. In the ascending world, uh, the price starts, let's say, at zero and keeps on increasing. And as the price keeps on increasing, you know, bidders uh, start dropping out from the auction. So bidder one drop, bidder two drop, bidder three drop. And let's say there are four bidders in the auction. Once bidder three dropped at price 45, then uh, the clock stops because only bidder four remains and he becomes the winner. 
Okay, so bid of four whips, but pay, pays the price of forty five. Okay, so uh, so of course there are many variations uh, in this stock. For instance, I'll assume that auctioneer is the seller, but that need not be the case. Sometimes the buyer is the auctioneer, and there are many sellers who are willing to sell the object. So these are what are called procurement auctions. Um, there are often reserve prices in auctions. So reserve prices is basically a price um, set by the auctioneer so that he will never sell the object, uh, you know, uh, basically below that price. So imagine an English auction where the clock starts not at zero, but at a higher price. And so basically by starting the clock at a higher price, the auctioneer uh, ensures that the object is never sold uh, below that price. So that would be called a reserve price. Many auctions have entry fees. So uh, bidders, in order to participate in auction, they need to pay some fees. So these are some of the variations that you observe in auctions. Uh, there are external factors also. In order to participate in auctions, you often, basically, you do some investments like uh, Telephone companies, if they want to participate in spectrum auctions, they, they need to build infrastructure for telephone sector. And these are sunk investment, whether they win or lose, you know, these investments are sunk, right? Uh, often there are resale opportunities. So you buy something and then you can sell it again tomorrow. So these are some of the external factors that can influence outcomes of auctions. So we should be aware of these things. So, so now in next 20 minutes, I'm going to get to the uh, you know, heart of the talk, which is basically uh, what is the model of Milgram and Wilson and what are their analysis which got them this Nobel Prize. So heart of this uh, contribution lies in understanding some of the key features of uh, modeling auctions. So one of these key features is, uh, you know, if I'm selling an object and I'm an auctioneer, what what is the willingness to pay of each of the bidders? Okay, so it's not very simple to realize what can be the willingness to pay. So this is usually perceived as the maximum amount a bidder is willing to pay. So this is the amount that uh, you know she can pay, and she becomes indifferent between getting the object and not getting. Okay, so in auction theory, this is called the value of the object. Okay, so value of the object is the maximum amount a bidder is willing to pay so that he is indifferent between getting the object and not getting. It's often not very easy to figure out, even for the bidder herself, what the willingness to pay is. So usually, uh, you know, you, you may have heard that, you know, these spectrum auctions, these uh, telephone companies, they hire consultants, you know, they hire consulting firms and do research about figuring out what exactly is the value of a spectrum to them, to them right? And we'll, we'll come to some uh, modeling choices uh, in this direction also. So what is not clear to, a, to an auctioneer are two things. First, auctioneer does not know the value of an object for a bidder. It also does not know how a bidder will behave in an auction. So these things basically determine uh, both the value of the object and her own personal behavior as a bidder, determine the bidding strategy of a bidder. So, so and this, is, uh, this uncertainty to the auctioneer is what is causing, you know, this huge literature in auction theory to emerge. So uncertainty is the key uh, uh, to this literature. And so these are environments where bidders have uncertainty about information and actions of other bidders. So if I am uh, a bidder in an auction and I may know my own value for the object, but I don't know what other bidders, how the other bidders value that object. Okay, Because that value is, is a private information to the other bidder. Second layer of uncertainty is that, you know, even though I may have some idea about the value of the object of the other bidder, I may not be sure how the other bidder would bid in the auction, whether he would be aggressive, 
very conservative and so on. So these kind of settings are very difficult to analyze, as you can imagine, because the layer of uncertainty is kind of twofold in some sense. So thanks to Harsani, uh, uh, you know, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1994. He laid out a framework to study these kind of uncertainty environments. And he introduced uh, this notion of Bayesian games and Beige Nash equilibrium, which is essentially a generalization of Nash equilibrium, if you have heard uh, about it, a generalization of Nash equilibrium to these uncertain environments, right? So this, uh, what he called Bayesian games, okay? And basically one of the first applications of these Beige, Bayesian games and Beige Nash equilibrium is in fact the auction theory. It has been applied to other kinds of uh, areas also like contract theory and so on and so forth. But the one of the main applications of Bayesian games is auction theory and it basically opened the door for modeling auctions and analyzing them. Okay, uh, so let me uh, talk about the first model of uh, auction, which is what is called the independent private values model. So to keep that in perspective, basically what this model is about, think of an art auction, which is usually, uh, you know, you see in all these art houses and so on. So, uh, so what is an art? You know, an art is something which different bidders would have different, uh, you know, subjective value for it, right? So I might value a piece of art differently than you do. And that's where the term private comes in. You know, so I, I privately know my own value and whatever information you have, another bidder has, has no value, has no influence in determining my value for it. Okay? So my value for the art is independent of whatever is happening in the whole world. Right? So that's what is called the independent private values in this case. Formally, auction theorists would say that uh, as an auctioneer, you know, all I know is that value of a bidder is an independent random variable whose realization is privately known. So this is this is the uh, this is the statistical way to frame the problem that as an auctioneer or as a fellow bidder, all I know is that there is an independent random variable from which uh, this particular value is realized, and and the bidder knows that uh, realization. Okay. So anyway, this is a model where everybody knows her own value perfectly, but the others don't what his or her value is. So uh, as I said, Vikri was the first one to win a Nobel Prize on auction. And basically, he was the one who analyzed this independent private values model. And he analyzed the equilibria in Harsani's term, the Beige Nash equilibria, of first price and second price auctions. And he showed that in first price auction, bidders basically bid below their value in some equilibrium, whereas in second price auction, they should bid their value, okay? But what is more interesting is that even though the bidding behavior of bidders are different across the two auctions, uh, I mean, in equilibrium, they're different, the expected revenue in both auctions is the same under this independent private values model. So this is what is famously known as the revenue equivalence theorem, that even though the two auction formats are the same, in expectation, they generate the same revenue. So auctioneer, if you're an auctioneer and you're evaluating these two auctions about uh, what would be my expected revenue in these auctions, then you should be indifferent between these two auction formats under independent private values. So notice that I'm using the term expectation repeatedly because uh, the realized revenue might be very different in first price and second price. But on an average, they would be the same. So sometimes first price will be better, sometimes second price, but on average, it will be the same, okay? And of course, uh, if you're a statistician, you might ask like, why do we care for the mean? Why don't we look at the variance or something, right? So of course you can look at the variance also. And uh, uh, you know, it has been shown that basically first price auction has a lower variance than the second price auction in terms of, ex expect in terms of revenue, okay? 
so you can look at higher order uh, movements also but uh, if you just look at the mean the expected revenue both the options uh, give you the same expected revenue okay so then you might ask what about the english option and the dutch option the ascending and the descending option well i'm going to argue here that english option is the same as the second price option so let's just look at this example suppose there are four bidders right and you know this is a model where every bidder knows her value absolutely fine they may not know others value but they know their own values perfectly so this is the values and suppose the clock starts at zero and keeps on increasing the price keeps on increasing like this in an ascending price auction so as soon as the clock reaches 10 the price reaches 10 Bidder one says, "Well, my value is only ten, so I can't pay more than ten. So buyer one drops out. Then at twenty, buyer two drops out, and at thirty, buyer three drops out. So remember the rule of the auction: as soon as there is exactly one buyer left in the auction, the auction stops, and so buyer four wins the object but pays thirty. And notice that thirty is the value of the second." highest uh, uh, buyer right second highest valued buyer so in a sense this auction is doing exactly what the second price auction would have done but in a natural price discovery mechanism so buyer for the highest uh, valued buyer wins but pays the second highest value okay, this would have been the outcome in the second price auction as well so second price and english options are equivalent in this model and first price and dutch options are also equivalent so that i am not going to tell you you should think about it why they are equivalent so in some sense the vickery's result is basically saying that all four option formats that is described are essentially the same later marsen shows that uh, uh, you know if you were to think about all kinds of option formats then a vickery option with an appropriately chosen reserve price maximizes expected revenue over all possible option formats so i'm not going to deliberate uh, on this because i'm uh, short of time but you should also uh, if you have time think about this a bit uh, and read up so so this was independent private values model uh, here is a different model <coughs> which wilson this uh, you know uh, introduced to the literature it's called the common values model so as an example to understand this model think of a mine okay so think of an auction where uh, we are auctioning the right to mine uh, a particular area and uh, the value for the mine of course for everyone is the same right because it depends on the amount of mineral in the mine and it is common to all so depend depending on the price of the mineral you know everybody would get the same value from the from the mine so so in that sense the value is common okay so so what is the uncertainty then if the value is common well bidders don't know how much uh, minerals are there in these mines right so what they do is different bidders do their own research get different information about the mine okay right so uh, i hire some price of water house coopers i uh, you hire some other consulting firm uh, somebody else has paul milgram you know so they do their own research to figure out what is the amount of mineral in the auction and conditional on their information they form an estimate of this common value okay so different bidders would have different estimates even though the value the exact value of the mine is common to everyone okay so this is the setting that wilson studied and he called it the common values model so this is very different from the independent private values of wickery where everybody was uh, sure about his value for the object and potentially everybody's value would have, would be different because i would value r differently than you would and so the values would be different whereas in a common values model the value of everyone is the same but different bidders have different information about this value so the question to ask is how should bidders bid in these kind of 
uh, auctions, say mine. And Wilson, uh, you know, uh, noticed a very interesting fact, which is now popularly called the winner's curse, which is about uh, like how people usually think of bidding in these auctions. You know, this is not how you should bid, but this is how people think about bidding in these auctions. Uh, so, for instance, in mine auctions. Okay, so uh, so uh, so if I'm a bidder, I have an estimate of the. Uh, you know, I have an estimate of the value of the mine, but my estimate can be very bad, you know, because uh, my research can be very bad. Somebody else might have done a very good uh, research, right? So what happens, like, suppose, uh, you know, I have done some research and according to my research, the value of the mine is very high, okay? But that might be way off, right? That might be way off and, but others, you know, they may have done a better research and would have found that the value of the mine is in fact not so high. So what would happen if I bid according to my own estimate, then I become the winner. And then I observe that others have bid very low. Then exposed, I realize that, wait a minute, then my estimate for this mine is actually not very uh, good because I see that others have bid very low. So exposed after winning i realized that this is not the right amount to pay so it, it must be that this mine has lower amount of minerals than what i thought so in some sense winning brings bad news to me okay so that's that's what uh, wilson uh, you know uh, calls uh, winner's curse and you see it repeatedly in these mine auctions in fact in 1960s that's where uh, when U.S. started to uh, do this offshore drilling auctions of, uh, you know, auction of these offshore drills in, in the Pacific Ocean and so on. And, and many people, uh, many bidders uh, suffered from this winners because they used to bid high without doing proper research and figure out, figure out that, uh, you know, there are some other firms who have done better research and, and, and the estimate is, should have been lower. So this is basically this idea that failure to foresee uh, this uh, fact that winner's expected value of the object conditional on other signal being lower is going to be lower than the unconditional expectation. So it's about the uh, bias of this estimate, you know, before you win the auction and after you win of the auction, win the auction. So. Uh, so what Wilson suggested is like uh, bidders should take into account this winner's curse when they are bidding. So they should not bid according to their estimate, but they should bid lower, shed their bid below their estimate in this common values auction. And so what he did was in fact, uh, uh, in, in the Harsani framework, he analyzed the base Nash equilibrium of this auction in this common values model. And, and said that bidders should uh, lower their bid from their estimate uh, to keep a profit margin as well as to offset this winner's curse. You know, so there is a double shedding of bids in these models. So this, um, you know, the first uh, effect was there in the independent private values model also, but the second effect is new to this common values model. Okay, so that's what Wilson showed. So that is the pioneering work about thinking about these particular uh, auctions and in a common values framework. I, I should put up this example of uh, Indian uh, context that uh, initially when, uh, you know, this was an era when uh, the only telephone provider was a government provider. And then suddenly government decided to open the telephone sector to other companies. And this is the first such option for rights to provide, uh, you know, telephone lines and so on. And the whole country was divided into circles. So these are basically states and you can bid on each of these states. And you see that uh, this is an unknown company at that time. It's called Himachal Futuristic communications limited i think so this company bid very high on many states whereas the second highest bidder was way lower than that okay and so 
if you were to think of these uh, options as a common value option because basically the customer base in every state is common to all the companies in some sense and then this is a classic example of a winner's curse failing to account for the fact that your estimate could be potentially way higher than the actual value so what you should be estimating is the conditional estimate that your uh, value of the object conditional on you winning right so that's what you should be estimating and and so winner's curse is there and of course what wilson showed is that uh, if you want to avoid this kind of winner's curse then you should adjust your bids accordingly okay very quickly i'm uh, going to now talk about uh, milgram's work in 5 minutes or something so uh, so so milgram uh, uh, basically is the bridge between vikri and wilson so he basically said that vikri's model is one extreme model where everybody knew their value perfectly and but didn't know others values and the wilson model is another extreme where uh, there is a common value to everyone okay everybody has their own estimates but there is uh, the value is common to everyone most real life models are somewhere between private and common value okay and so that's uh, i'm going to give you some examples and so on but uh, you were the first to formalize this and analyze this model what they call uh, um, you know in their word uh, words it's called the interdependent values model so interdependent means that uh, uh, nobody is sure about their value and uh, your value may depend on what information you have as well as what information everybody else may have okay so uh, so so their milgram and weber's contribution was to analyze these auctions uh, you know uh, rank the auctions in terms of revenue and uh, analyze the equilibria of this first price second price english dutch auctions in this interdependent values model which is you know which is a uh, which is kind of uh, uh, you know a compromise or 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 basically more general model than the vickrys or wilson's model okay so i'm going to give you an example to convince you that uh, you know the milgram weber makes the most sense of uh, of all these three models so so let's go back to that gujarat guild auctions you know suppose there are four shops in a shopping complex there are two types of med, uh, two medicine shops and two book shops okay and uh, there is a holiday and there is an auction to open exactly one shop okay so uh, so in this case the bidders are the shops and so the first question to ask is what is the value of a shop Uh, from opening uh, its shop on that particular day well if you if you let's think about the medicine shop uh, for a moment uh, well if, if you know if i were in an independent private values model then the medicine shop would perfectly know what his value is okay and uh, uh, so i'll i'll tell you in a minute that that's not a realistic assumption in a common values model all the shops would have the same value from opening the shop on that day okay and i'll tell you that that's also not a realistic assumption in this case so think of the medicine shop right so what is the value for the medicine shop by keeping its shop open well he is going to get all his own customers that usually come on a regular day okay so let's assume that in all days the same uh, you know in expectation the same demand is there and so on and so he will get his own demand but he will also get the demand of the other shop right other medicine shop there are two medicine shop and two book shops but of course the book those who go to the book shop won't come to the medicine shop so his value for the uh, for opening the shop the medicine shop Will depend on its own demand, so that's what uh, Milgram and Weber would call a signal, which he observes privately, his own demand. But will also depend on the demand of the other medicine shop, which the other medicine shop knows. But it will not depend on the demand of the book shops, right? 
so value of the bookshops and medicine shops are not common so bookshops have a different value from opening the shop and uh, medicine shops have a different value from opening the shops a bookshops uh, value depends on the other medicine shops demand so it depends on on that information but it does not depend on the uh, on the information of the bookshop so in that sense this is neither a common values model nor a private values model so this is somewhere in between that and what this is what is called the interdependent values model so medicine shops value depends on another medicine shop may not depend on the bookshop okay so milgram and weber basically analyzed the equilibria of these uh, these kind of models and uh, basically analyze the equilibria of first price second price and english auction so they specify the equilibrium bidding strategies of bidders in this more general model okay and provide a revenue ranking of these three options so remember in the independent private values case all four auctions gave the same expected revenue one of their contributions in this model is that as soon as the private values assumption is not there independent private values assumption is not there this revenue equivalence is lost so they show in fact what they show is that english auction generates the ascending price auction generates the highest expected revenue followed by the second price and followed by the first price auction this is not uh, surprising if you think about it uh, so the idea here is that in in their model in the interdependent uh, values model in the interdependent values model my value depends on the information of the others right so if uh, if i am a medicine shop if i observe that the other medicine shop uh, owner dropped out of the auction at some point then i have a good idea about what the what his shop's demand must be right so information about uh, other shops demand would actually help other bidders and english auction reveals more information about bidders because you see other bidders dropping out in the english auction and you can infer a lot about uh, you know their information and so on and update your estimated value whereas the sealed bid auctions are like you know one shot auction no information is revealed and so you have a very bad sense of the actual uh, value your actual value and so usually bidders bid lower and the bidding is less aggressive uh, in equilibrium and as a result english auction beats them okay so in general basically the milgram and weber established what they call a linkage principle so under the linkage principle uh, essentially what they show is uh, it's not specific to english auction but any auction where the payment of the winner is linked to more information of the bidders and auctioneer and so on those kind of auctions would generate more revenue than auctions where winning bidders uh, um, uh, you know payment depends less on other bidders okay and this is you can think of it vaguely as this reduces winner curse through better estimate of the value and results in aggressive bidding okay because if there is a severe winner curse bidders in equilibrium would tend to bid less to account for this winner curse and so essentially by revealing more information i am giving them a better estimate of the value and hence they would bid aggressively okay so uh, i still have about uh, uh, 10 minutes right amarendra yes yes please go ahead okay okay so, so i i think uh, you know i am basically done uh, with the uh, you know particular contributions of uh, milgram and wilson so i'm now going to give some examples of uh, some other uh, you know contributions that uh, particularly of milgram that was mentioned in the nobel prize uh, document so before i get into that let me basically state again that before game theory you know became prominent in economics 
the predominant thread in economics was this idea of general equilibrium and that markets can discover prices automatically you know so you, you know the, the markets are perfect they can always discover prices and so on of course we we know that there are a lot of imperfections in the market and essentially and uh, you know two assumptions uh, which are very cru crucial uh, in getting to this perfect markets uh, uh, idea and discovery of prices is that agents are not strategic you know so if i'm participating in a market i don't strategize like what will happen if i accept a certain price would the prices go up uh, you know i don't strategize so agents are not strategic in that sense and another minor assumption is that goods are divisible you know so that helps in analysis quite a bit but in many settings goods are not divisible so you can think of auctions as a way of escaping these two assumptions and basically uh, the auction procedures that i talked about especially the english auction uh, these are basically price discovery mechanisms okay and overcomes these problems in a strategic environment and one of the uh, things that uh, you know uh, the nobel prize was given one of the contributions of these two laureates were was that uh, they have figure, uh, they have made some let me call it recommendations about how to sell multiple object so so far i have only talked about options where you sell one object like one art piece one mind and one house and so on or one advertisement but usually you know in many settings you sell multiple objects and then it becomes really complicated right because how do we sell multiple objects do we sell them one by one do we sell them all together if you sell them all together then uh, what kind of prices should be maintained how does it happen so wilson in fact was the first one to think about this so he thought about it in a divisible goods model in his favorite common value model uh, and uh, so you know he he devised a procedure and analyzed its equilibria but what is uh, more prominent nowadays uh, i mean which is mentioned in the nobel prize uh, citation is milgram and wilson's recommendation to um, fcc the federal commission which which is in charge of uh, selling spectrum to telephone companies and uh, other broadcasting uh, authorities uh, broadcasting companies in us uh, so these uh, these uh, you know fcc regularly sells what they call spectrums in different regions in many countries this is done and these are basically indivisible goods and they are sold many of them are sold simultaneously so for instance uh, you know the spectrum of haryana delhi and punjab would be put up for auction simultaneously and you can either get haryana or punjab or you can get all three or you can just get delhi you know so different things can happen and these are very complicated auctions i think uh, you know i can offer a course on this so uh, but all i want to point out is some salient features of this and what will wilson and uh, uh, wilson and milgram did so let's look at uh, one example suppose there are two objects a and b and uh, how would a bidder value them well bidder can uh, you know buy object a alone object b alone or objects a and b together and you know bidder uh, you know one bidder may have no value for object a for instance think of a uh, let's say a, a, a buying a, a, a laptop and an operating system right so if you just give me a laptop you know it has no value unless i get the operating system right so uh, you know a laptop alone or an operating system alone has no value for it for you but a laptop and an operating system has a very high value for you okay but uh, think of another bidder who uh, you know who uh, uh, who probably uh, has uh, you know think think of these as uh, these objects as uh, you know ipl teams okay you are shahrukh khan 
and you are bidding for kolkata mumbai and uh, let's say um, you know chennai right and so uh, as sharuk khan you know i don't want to you know i may be not allowed to win more than one team so if you give me two teams i'm just going to say i don't want uh, this team i just take one of the teams okay and so basically uh, you know so uh, so in this case the two objects are substitutes of each other okay so these kind of crazy things can happen and so that's why these kind of uh, multiple object auctions are often called combinatorial auctions so if you think of uh, uh, 10 objects then there are two to the power 10 bundles of objects possible and you can bid on any of these two to the power 10 bundles right so these that's why these are combinatorial auctions and uh, one of the problems that uh, you know milgram and wilson realized in these auctions is that suppose i first auctioned object a and then i auctioned object b then what can happen so think of the auction of object a first well uh, bidder 1 is competing with bidder 2 he knows that you know if he gets object b then he will have a very high value for object a plus b but to uh, get to the auction of object b he has to win object a right and uh, so he bids aggressively in object uh, on object a but what can happen is that he wins object a but because he bid aggressively in object a when it comes to object b he is not able to bid aggressively and bidder 2 wins object b so what can happen is now bidder one is stuck with object a and so this is what is called the exposure problem that uh, uh, if you auction these objects sequentially then one bidder may be stuck with an unwanted object okay so that's why um, milgram and wilson recommended that uh, all the objects should be put up for auction simultaneously and bids for them must be considered simultaneously okay so you might have some other kind of problem also this is called the free rider problem you know if there are three bidders then two bidders can uh, basically uh, you know free ride on on a third bidder's bid and win the object and so these kind of things uh, uh, can happen so in this case one of the bidders had uh, substitute valuations uh, here the, these kind of things can happen if one of the bidders have complement values okay so so these are some of the things that uh, uh, you know uh, are issues in combinatorial auctions so multiple objects sold simultaneously objects can be complements or substitutes this has enormous applications in fact the most of the real life examples uh, usually involve sale of multiple objects okay so either you think of spectrum even for mining rights multiple uh, you know coal mines are put up for auctions uh, simultaneously and these are some of the other uh, examples i have given so let's look at this uh, airport slot auction so these were done in us so what 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 was done is like uh, let's say the airport of uh, mumbai and delhi there are different slots and airlines could bid on the slots to get those slots right and so if you were to think if uh, slots in mumbai and delhi are auctioned if i am indigo and i buy a 9 am slot in delhi then my flight must take off at about 10 o'clock from delhi and it will land in mumbai let's say 12 o'clock so i would ideally like to buy a slot at 12 o'clock in mumbai so there is this very high synergy between two slots across two airports within a particular time interval but in the same time interval inside delhi itself indigo may have substitutable preferences right i mean indigo may not want an additional slot at delhi at 10 o'clock itself so uh, so these kind of substitutes and complements uh, you know are very important concerns in multiple object auctions and basically these uh, are also these were also concern for fcc and milgram and wilson and another famous uh, auction theorist preston mccafe uh suggested to them what is now known as the simultaneous multi round auction sma and that basically is now implemented in pretty much all combinatorial auction environments 
and of course the theoretical properties of these options are very difficult to analyze and uh, so theoretical results are limited but there have been many simulations and uh, many kind of uh, data collection and, and uh, empirical studies have been done on these kind of options so uh, but theoretical results in this literature are limited so i can't tell you that you know this particular multi object option gives you the highest expected revenue so such a statement is very difficult to make uh, in this so all those uh, you know revenue ranking of options and so on is only for single object options and we know very little about multi object option theoretical analysis analysis and of course people have done uh, rigorous simulations and you know data analysis and so on and uh, so those are empirical results and uh, so those are also interesting but uh, i am not an expert on those uh, okay so let me end by saying that uh, you know uh, auctions for uh, by the government is now becoming very uh, common and uh, you know in this uh, day and age we should talk about vaccine procurement and this is one of the uh, you know uh, uh, it's an age old uh, tradition in, not only in india but also in all governments across the world to procure vaccines through bidding you know so these these are called procurement auctions and these are regularly done and uh, uh, these need to be analyzed and, uh, and so on uh, and there are various issues with that specific to that environment and uh, so these need specific studies and so on spectrum auctions we have all heard about them and uh, it comes regularly in newspapers but uh, these are again theoretically very complex to analyze but uh, heuristic uh, proposals are given by uh, milgram and wilson and mccafe and these are now used all over the world uh, uh, auction for emission rights so pollution permits are given to various uh, companies using auctions and basically each country has a quota of emissions and different uh, companies are given those quotas using auctions these days these are more complicated auctions where people uh, you know bidders bid on price quantity pairs and so they are different kinds and uh, let me uh, talk about a particular kind of auction these are coal mine auctions so these auctions are nowadays held on royalty so you don't bid uh on the right to auction but you bid on the revenue share so after you bid you uh, you know you take the mine and you get some uh, revenue and the bidding is on the percentage of revenue that you give to the uh, to the auctioneer to the government in particular and so these this is a different uh, model and uh, and these have been studied in auction theory also usually these kind of auctions involve lot of other uh, you know features like there are technical bids in the first round only a fraction of those are qualified and uh, upfront payments are made by successful bidders and so on and so forth if you are interested you should look at uh, coal india's uh, website and they have detailed procedure about how they go about uh, doing these auctions uh, you know again these are not something which have been analyzed rigorously uh, difficult perhaps but i think these are all open areas to study and so on so concluding thoughts uh, i should uh, just conclude by saying that uh, you know milgram and wilson although i talked about auction theory uh, you know we were discussing before the talk their contributions go way beyond auction theory uh, they have uh, uh, seminal contributions in information economics game theory reputation <coughs> and other areas mm, uh, the beauty of their contribution i mean i just gave you a very rough sketch of their contribution but the beauty of their contribution lies in appreciating the modeling choices that they had made you know so uh, all these environments are so complex uh, to say something in these environments uh, requires very careful modeling which makes sense in real life as well as uh, you know analytically tractable and and the beauty of their contribution is that they are able to achieve both of that you know so they, they propose a model which is analytically convenient and also makes practical sense 
Okay, so last takeaway from this talk is that whenever you see that a particular auction failed in India because it did not generate uh, enough revenue, you should uh, step back a little bit and say that this is only one instance of this auction, right? This is only one instance. What Milgram and Wilson and Vikri are saying is that in expectation, certain auctions would give more revenue or give the same revenue. For instance, Milgram and Weber would say that English auction will generate in expectation the highest revenue. But that does, that does not mean that at every realization of the state of the world, English auction would be the best. You know, in some cases, it will do worse than others. In some cases, it will do better than others. In expectation, it will do well. So that basically means that many auctions will sometimes fail and sometimes it will succeed. Right? So, so you, we should always keep this very simple principle in mind that auction theory is about expected revenue. It's not about uh, instantaneous uh, revenue, like in every instance, what is the revenue generated? Okay, thank you. Let me stop here. I will be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Mistra. Uh, in fact, now I uh, am realizing why Silu was talking so high of you. In fact, uh, uh, I say brand itself gives you know, also phobia that there will be a lot of equations and a lot of mathematics, modeling and so on. Uh, and, but so I was a little bit apprehensive whether you can understand or not. But then the way you, would, uh, uh, the way you, ex the way you explain the things. Oh, I think everyone of us uh, have understood things very clearly. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that report, uh, let me open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, I think Professor uh, Banikan Misra is already raising hand as a good student. I think so. We get the first priority. Uh, to no, ask. Sir, I want the, the Professor Devas Misra to continue for longer. A fantastic talk. I agree with Amarendra. I have listened to two talks completely from two ISI professors. Uh, one from you today. And the other one from Satya Bhai, Professor Satya Bhai, the Darshan Game okay, Theory. Okay, okay. You people are remarkable in making things so simple. So, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> gave a talk an introduction to game theory. Outstanding. So, <laughs> sir, I agree with that. Just to one comment and one question so that other people can talk. Okay. Comment is, of course, in public private partnerships, also, these auctions are being used. Yes. And there is a Swiss challenge kind of system which is coming to play in public private partnership. To ensure that there is some advantage given to the you know, companies which have come up with a novel idea. So it's an interesting kind of two stage auction. Okay. Yes, yes. Challenge a two stage auction. That's an interesting thing if you have any comments on that. Yeah. But more seriously, in fact, two weeks back when we were having this uh, uh, talk by Dr. Matilde Aducci and I had invited um, Professor, the legendary Amit Bhaduri, he just wrote to me, Bani, I would not be able to attend today's talk. But uh, you, you heard about the Nobel Prize in economics and auction. Make sure, and that, that talk was on mining partly. He said, make sure your legs and minds are not auctioned away. There has been criticism by many people, but in particular by Nick Ka in that uh, journal, which says that this auction price has failed to account for public policy, has sometimes been against the public interest, and in particular, the FCC spectrum auction 1994. They are also charging that Milgram and Wilson, all that, they, you know, they are applying Pacific Bell. And they are also questioning the integrity of funding of economic research. That's a very serious issue. What is your reaction or take on that? And I know it's a controversial topic, but if you like yeah. to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So regarding the first question, I, I think, uh, I mean, the first comment about, uh, uh, you know, the some players being given, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, priority and so on. This is regularly done all over the world. You know, so the uh, the weak bidders are given some kind of preference through some kind of you know their bids are weighted higher in some sense. So you may think, uh, for instance, that if there is a local bidder and then and if there is a global bidder, then if if I want to protect the local bidder by this global bidder, which might have a lot of uh, wealth in its disposal. 
so uh, in that sense you might give some priority to the local bidders by weighing its bid so if i bid 20 rupees my bid would be counted as 40 in that sense right so this is a very common practice all over the world and auction theory can take into account that so these are what are called asymmetric bidders and uh, the analysis becomes uh, you know uh, um, slightly complicated but basically the suggestion of auction theory is also that you should treat the weaker bidders with uh, uh, a weight to compensate so that, he, uh, that there is more competition right otherwise if there is no competition then everything would be sold at, at a cheap price so the, it is essential that uh, we weigh these bid, uh, weak bidders appropriately to raise revenue and so on regarding the second point you know i you know of course uh, you know these are their personal choices i you know i cannot say anything but you know the price is about uh, their contributions which is uh, of course uh, independent of these things uh, the the other issue that uh, the uh, spectrum auctions are uh, a big failure in india especially and there are reasons for that and uh, one one thing i basically also discussed towards the end that in all these spectrum auctions or mining auctions in all these government uh, resource auctions you know when bidders decide to bid on it they need to uh, upfront do a lot of investment right so for instance uh, think of a company like idea for instance right if they want to make a serious bid about uh, capturing a lot of market they first establish a lot of infrastructure throughout india so that they can claim spectrum and then basically uh, you know uh, invest uh, uh, you know provide those services but what happens is like in many of these cases what is happening is like uh, weak companies are able to uh, get a lot of loans from banks and so on in the hope of winning these things and basically uh, they win some of it but because they have already spent so much of their cash on these uh, spectrum winning they are not able to expose invest in any infrastructure development and so this is this is a major drawback of auction theory that it fails to account for these income effects right so everything in auction theory is without any income effect so income effects are rarely taken into account but specifically in these cases because the stakes are so high income effects are really important and basically if you have an auction where the winner takes everything and those who have invested something you know they get only very small things you know so it's not a very uh, conducive environment in that sense so i i i would say that Milgram and Weber, when they started, you know, they were the first ones to think about it. You know, so they obviously don't think of these things in the first model that you write down, right? And of course, research has been done now, taking into account these kind of things. And of course, these are enriching these models of Milgram, Weber, and Wilson. Okay. Uh, of course, when these, uh, you know, ideas would come into practice and when would, uh, you know, governments uh, listen to all these ideas and how to, uh, you know, account for these uh, enriched models and their results, you know, it will take time, I, I guess. You know? so, so right now they are just, uh, you know, it's very heuristic in, in some sense because we are not, uh, I would say, realizing the exact model that is there in this uh, government resource auctions and so on in, in some sense yeah. that would be my answer yeah. okay thank you so much uh, professor mr uh, there are a couple of questions uh, on the chart window okay let me uh, open it. I'd like to take up a few questions yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh interesting question let me uh, okay Okay, so one first question is how does interdependent value model works for substitute and complementary good? So when I was talking about selling multiple objects, I was mostly talking about private values, right? So I was talking about like if I want uh, my value for for uh, for uh, spectrum of Haryana is different from your value for spectrum of Haryana and so on and so forth. 
of course we can uh, enlarge this by having a more complicated model where uh, nobody has any idea about the actual value for spectrum of haryana my value for spectrum of haryana would depend on what kind of research i have done what kind of research uh, bani sir has done and what kind of research amrendra has done so i would like to know all these information and then only i can tell you what the value is and of course these models would become like mega complicated in that case right and uh, all these milgram wilson mccaffrey they make the simplifying assumption that we are working in private values and so on and and make some heuristic uh, recommendations in that uh second question was uh oh what's the difference between delicensing and auction so i i don't know exactly what is delicensing i i presume that it is this thing that you know uh which was done which attracted a lot of uh, controversy i guess that whoever comes with the bid first i give the spectrum to that person you know so it's what is called a beauty contest right so basically and so that's that's basically you know you toss a coin and give it to someone so it's uh, really bad because uh, uh, you know the person you give it to might have really have a very low value for it and then you get very low revenue from that basically right the person who comes first need not be the guy who values it the most right so uh, so so that's what is these licensing and auction is a natural price discovery process essentially is winner curves only applicable to common values or it has some affinity with the private value so private value there is no winner curves because i know my value so there is no ambiguity about what i would be willing to pay because i know my value right it only happens if my value depends on others information okay so that's when the winner's curse is because then you have to estimate get a correct estimate of the value and these estimates can go wrong and usually whoever is the winner his estimate is higher than the actual estimate actual value and that's why the winner's curse comes in okay so winner's curse is only there in interdependent values models uh, so the next so what is reverse auction so this is an excellent question what is reverse auction so reverse auctions are done in procurement like in vaccines so if i am government and i am buying vaccines and there are many uh, sellers then what i will do is uh, i will do exactly flip the english auction ascending auction i will flip it and that's what is called the english auction so i'll say that i'll pay a very high price for these vaccines then everybody would be interested to supply the vaccine at that price then i'll continuously uh, lower it till exactly one supplier is left right because uh, uh, you know to supply vaccine these guys will incur costs so i have to compensate them so it's a dual world in some sense okay so that reverse auction is basically the analog of english auction in procurement can the conservation auctions inform by Uh, so this this uh, chilika question is very complicated you know it requires uh, so there is a question about whether the auctions for uh, conservation may uh, make any difference to the chilika lake the, this is a very different question you know you should not ask this to a theorist at least because uh, i don't know the details of these models and of course these things need to be thought through before putting these things into auctions and so on as i said you know auction theory is not robust to all these things like sunk investments and different bidders you know having very low uh, value and very high in value and so on so you need to think through these things uh what would be your take on the efficiency of auction is the process transparent so uh, so in general the first part of my talk was more about uh, revenue maximization like which auction generates more expected revenue another objective of uh, auctioneer is what is called efficiency so you just want to guarantee that the object goes to the bidder who values it the most uh, this may not be the same and you know if you're interested you should read my notes okay, this is not a good uh, uh, time to discuss that but efficiency and revenue maximization are two different objectives 
and uh, both will require different studies and of course typically this government resource auctions are meant to achieve efficiency and not to achieve revenue maximization so sometimes the government itself gets confused that it says we want to be efficient but it also says that we want to generate a lot of revenue in many models of auction these two are incompatible if you want to be efficient you can't maximize expected revenue if you want to maximize expected revenue you should not be efficient okay in many models that is the case so i, I think this will require careful thought uh, and of course the objective of the government should be to maximize efficiency where efficiency would not only mean to maximize the value of the consumers but also the you know future generations in these cases if you are putting this environmental uh, you know areas for auctions and so on so you need to account for value of future generations and so it requires a more careful modeling of these things okay that's it i think yeah okay uh, thank you so much uh, professor mr in fact i'm feeling so happy uh, because you know i got enough food for the day today okay. and, uh, that's how that that makes my day actually thank and, you thank uh, you for inviting me again now before uh, we uh, close let me uh, offer a formal vote of thanks uh, on behalf of the orissa economics association i express my deep sense of gratitude to professor devasis mishra for enlightening us uh, about the basic concepts of auction theory and different models of auction and the awards of this year's nobel laureates and uh, i would again uh, like to uh, uh, tell that no again this is a weekend and then professor mishra kindly agreed actually to uh, spare his time with us because i requested professor mishra that most of the students and faculty members Uh, would be busy in other working days, so this would be a good, this would be a good day actually for all of us. And uh, he is kindly agreed. So I I really thank you for you know giving a valuable time, and I also look forward uh, uh, to your uh, more association with our Orissa Economic Association and particular the state. And uh, uh, and I would like to thank Kesilu uh, for. Uh, Uh, basically telling me that you know when actually on one day as well i and silu were having a chat and then silu told me that sir uh, uh, professor devasis mishra of isa delhi you now would be uh, is working in this uh, field actually uh, his uh, all work actually is in the field of auction theory and i had to invite him actually to give a talk and then i did i told that see we are looking for such people actually who are uh, from odisha and working outside the state and uh, i don't think that we could have got any better person than you actually uh, uh, to speak on this auction theory so for that actually you know all credit goes to silu for establishing this contact uh, with professor uh, misra thank you silu uh, for this and uh, now again i would like to thank uh, uh, the president of orissa economic association uh, professor babeshan and all the members of executive committee Uh, for kindly agreeing to uh, again in this webinar, and I would like to thank uh, the former presidents of Police Economic Association, like Professor Banikan Misra, uh, is also uh, the former president of Police Economic Association, and he is also a life member of the association. And uh, there are many other members uh, uh, who have joined in this webinar. I think our maximum number had gone up to uh, 78 or something. So we had a good audience actually, and uh, the questions such that we also got, I think, were uh, pretty good actually. And many of them, for the information of Professor Devasis Mishra, many of the participants that I can see are uh, lecturers in different colleges, and there are many students who are doing PhD or MA in economics. Uh, so that way, I think you know it has reached actually to a larger audience, and particularly to uh, uh, different parts of the state, okay? because many of them are teachers. So uh, yeah. they can also uh, uh, give this idea to their students. Actually, what is this auction theory all about? Because So even I also did not know much about auction theory, uh, mm -hmm. so that's why no, I am. That's why I am telling that I am feeling so happy actually today, because I got uh, so much of knowledge from you. And though you taught us, uh, it was really beautiful actually. Okay, yeah. and I am giving really a round of applause actually to you actually. It is wonderful. And, uh, uh, so, so with that, uh, we shall conclude. Uh, and again, I would like to give thanks to all the participants who. 
uh, spend their weekend uh, uh, for the, uh, getting this knowledge. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And, uh, it was really nice to talk Good to see Vijay Krishna's name there. Yeah, so I just put up a slide on, uh, uh, on some books that you may refer. I mean, some of these books are available online also to search for it. But, you know, Vijay Krishna is a, is a famous author, I mean, one of the pioneers in this field. And his book is a classic book for graduates. So that is an advanced book. Uh, but but uh, the book of the Paul Spencer is quite uh, okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's for, uh, um, uh, you know, you need to basic technical form. So if you are in Okay. Uh, you are going to talk. You are muted. Oh, Bani Kansa is telling something. I, I think he is muted. No, I was just telling him that Vijay Krishna and I are the same batch in Delhi School. Oh, okay. I take, I take pride in my brilliant friends because I was at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> Vijay and I were. Vijay Krishna. Uh, I, also, I also want to uh, take this occasion to say one thing that, uh, you know, we at ISO uh, usually, you know, uh, uh, all of us would like to give you a small lecture on this emerging area to people like you, I mean, who are especially people who are teaching in colleges and so on to get them exposed to these things and basically give them ideas to offer courses in these new areas to students and what can be a very basic level course and so on. And if you find that this is, this is something that you would like to do, please let me know and I will arrange many such lectures in fact uh, on uh, on you know so the you know i agree that most of us do very esoteric research very mathematical and so on but we also know how to reach out to our audience so we would uh, basically love to do this and we have been thinking a lot because uh, most of our students are either from delhi university uh, i mean most of them are from delhi university some of them are from iits now and some of them are from uh, uh, Calcutta, but we would ideally like to reach out to all corners of India, you know, so the, you know, talent is something which is uniformly distributed all over India. That's my conjecture all the time. And so we, sh I mean, the only difference is Delhi University students have seen something that you haven't seen. That's the only difference. You know, so I think it's important that uh, all of you should be exposed to such things, whether you understand or not, it's a different issue, but you can always go back and look up and we can tell you where to look up. And so I think it's uh, better that you organize such small, small seminars and, uh, you know, broader themes and so on. So I, I'm open to taking uh, uh, such seminars. You know, so, okay. Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Uh, Amarendra, you are muted again. Amarendra. Yeah. For the information of all participants, the link has been shared uh, by Silu, uh, where the uh, the uh, teaching notes of Professor Misra uh, uh, are available. So uh, I think the participants uh, can take benefit of that. Just click this link and save it on your uh, on your window, so that uh, by the time we close this uh, discussion. You will have that link with you. Of course, you can visit uh, the website of ISA Delhi and uh, get that link also. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Amrindar? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Sanjay, uh, Professor Patnaik from XUV, Javier University. Uh, I, uh, in fact, I'd like to have the, the recording of uh, Professor Mishra. Is it possible to get that somewhere? Yeah, we shall upload this entire uh, video recording on the YouTube channel of Orissa Economics Association. Yeah, in fact, I, I know Professor Mitra because I will, I gave a job to uh, you know, long, long back in uh, ISI Delhi for ISI Bangalore, actually, in fact. And he was there in my job talk as well. So I know him very well, but I don't know whether he remembers me. <laughs> no, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's what. So anyway, thank you very much. And it's a really nice talk, uh, Professor Mishra. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we shall close here. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. Namaskar, Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Sidhu, you have to live before us. We are the host. We are we here. We are people who live the last. Sidhu is also a life member of Orissa Economic Association. Well, so let me take a second step because I was a former office bearer. I would leave only after everyone else sleeps. And I'm going to live the last. <laughs> yes. Okay, bye bye.